Hi, this is Kenny Albert. You're listening to the Broadway Hat Podcast with your host, Kyle Hall, the number one podcast for all things Rangers hockey. Welcome back to the Broadway Hat Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Hall. Some big news at the NHL this week. It looks like we finally have a date for training camp to start. January 3rd is our post slated date, with the season starting around January 13th. The Rangers have also opened up their training facility this week for some informal skating, and they have already about 15 to 20 players that are already on the ice. The NHL rumor mill is also now in full effect, with the Rangers rumored to be a possible destination for both Zdeno Chara and Max Pacioretty. Chara would fill a need for a left-hand defenseman, but it would be interesting to see the Rangers go with a 43-year-old veteran over some of the younger players they have in the organization right now. This week, we're joined by former New York Ranger Daniel Lacroix. Dan shares some great stories from the 94 Cup season, his experience playing for Mike Keenan, and his time as an assistant coach on the Rangers during their run to the Cup Finals in 2014. Let's send it over to an interview with Dan. Today we are joined by former Ranger draft pick, player, and coach, uh, Daniel Lacroix. How are you today? Very good. How are you? Good, good. Good. So, uh, so now you're down in beautiful. We just talked offline. You're down in beautiful Tampa. Now you're taking a break from your uh, Quebec team. Yep, it's a little bit of a change in, in weather, obviously, coming from uh, northeast to uh, to the south. But it's been uh, it's been a good little. Uh, I've only been here a few days now, but it's a good change. Place to be, especially in <laughs> December. So, uh, actually, jumping back to your Quebec playing days. So you played three years uh, up in the Quebec Junior League. You put up some crazy numbers up there, not only for penalty minutes, but for points. Yeah, the uh, you know, I was fortunate. I, I, I broke into the league in, in 86, 87, and uh, with a real good team. Like, we had the best team in, in the uh, country at the time, and the players that, you know, a lot of people would remember. Uh, Pierre Turgeon was our, uh, our, our captain, uh, Eric Desjardins. Uh, we're all the same age group, so we're pretty young, young group, but still, like I think, the best team in, in Canada. So that that was my start with uh, the Grand B Bisons, and uh, I seem to improve every year. With we, I had the same coach. I was fortunate to have the same coach, and and by my my uh, my third year there as a 19 year old, I I ended up you know scoring over 40 goals. But I, if if somebody with the opportunities that I had at at better hands, he would have scored 60. I'm just that's the honest <laughs> truth. Like I, I put myself in a lot of good situations, score goals around the net, and uh, I'm fortunate to get a, quite a few in. Now talking about the young, co- you know, your coaching when you were younger, did they encourage? So you had 311 penalty minutes your first year, and then yeah. you jumped up to 466 your second year. <laughs> so is that something that you really focused on when you came into the league, or is that something you morely developed as you went along? I think I was just an angry kid a little bit, and I wanted to make a place uh, for myself. And and I jumped, I jumped with a, a really good team that had a lot of skills, and and I I you know, found that for me to contribute was to play a physical game every night. So when you're, I know in that era, when you're uh, you're out there banging every night, then then uh, people will will come knocking, and and I didn't back down. And uh, for me, it was a way to get you know to get noticed and and be a solid contributor to my team and and the penalty minutes uh, piled up I, I i don't think you know the 460 they i, I believe my second year the, the referees were getting a lot of 10 minute penalties at, at the end of games just to get guys out of out of the uh out of the game if, if it got nasty a little bit so that might explain the, a lot of those minutes now the rangers did take notice they took you 31st overall in 1987 so what was that like back then because there was no was there a draft, or was that more of like you found out via phone call? No, there was there was a draft. Like I'm, I'm uh, it's, yeah, you're right. It's it's a little while back, but uh, the draft has been uh, <laughs> going on for a while. But for you young guys out there, like uh, 1987, the draft was in uh, Detroit, and and uh, but the format was different. If if you're a 17 year or an 18 year old, uh, you can only uh, get drafted in the three first rounds. So it was limited to uh, to three rounds uh, at that time. So I was rated, I think, at the end of the fourth round or fifth round. So I 
I, I went there with my agent and I didn't take a, any of my family with me. I, I, I had had a couple interviews with uh, different teams and the Rangers being one of them. So I knew there was interest, but because of the three round, uh, it was a, really a gamble to see if I'd be uh, drafted or not. So I ended up going there with my agent. We, we they had, took a bus from Montreal and, and went to Detroit. And I was walking around the concourse, not really expecting anything, especially in the second round. And, and when I heard my name being called, I was the, I believe I was the happiest kid there. Um, so from there, uh, you went to the uh, Binghamton Rangers, which was your first step up into uh, the AHL level. Now, you played on some really good Binghamton teams. I feel like they were really dominant in the early 90s. Uh, you were on the 92-93 team, which had the most points in uh, AHL history. I think that still actually stands today. And you played with a guy named Don Biggs while you were there. Yeah. So he had uh, so he had 138 points in one season, uh, which still stands today. Why is a guy like that, when you look at his career stats, why do you think a guy like that never got a real shot in the NHL? Well, I, for a couple of reasons, I, I think, uh, like, I was fortunate that, again, like, with the Rangers, it, we, I think my first year was actually in, in the IHL. Our team was in Flint, Michigan. Then we moved to Binghamton, and uh, it, we always lined up some really strong teams. And, and I think the Rangers' philosophy was the same with, with the, their NHL team was – they traded uh, for older players often time. And, you know, they had key young pieces that they were building the team around with, uh, you know, Mike Richter and Brian Leach. And then you would add on some really uh, great complimentary established guys in the league. And they, that was their philosophy on top. And, and same with in the minors. Like I got to Binghamton, my second year pro, and they had three left wingers that were over 29 or 30 years old and I was a young left winger coming with the team and I'm saying to myself like I'm never going to get a shot they had Joe Patterson, Bob Bodak, Russ Fitzpatrick were all established AHL guys and uh, I might be missing one too so you have to buy your time like they didn't give you an opportunity you have to earn it and and for me I think I I had signed a lot of different contracts and and it took Took a while, but once I was uh, played regular with the Binghamton Rangers, and and I was surrounded by really good players, and 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 the player like Biggs was uh, certainly one of the better uh, American League players. And I think some of those guys, like you, I, I look at Don Biggs and I look at Sean Van L, and they're they're two players. He was playing in Cape Breton, and they were both top of the league in scoring. Uh, but some some players choose to. Uh, you know, make a sacrifice and say, okay, what do I need to do to play at the next level? And, um, and like a Sean Van Allen ended up playing a defensive role in the NHL and Don Biggs never really got a shot on the two uh, top two uh, lines in the NHL. So he ended up being a, a career minor leaguer, but an excellent one at that. So while you were down there, you talk about the young talent the Rangers had, including yourself. So you had, uh, you know, uh, Alexei Kovalev came over, uh, Zubov came over. Those were their first introduction to the American style yeah. hockey. So what was it like seeing those guys first come over and, uh, you know, kind of take the American ice and, and see how what they can do? Well, everything was so new. Like now we get, you know, Russians come in and, and we have some with, with our junior teams uh, every year. Europeans will come in and, and they're, they're so well versed on the North American style of hockey and, and on, on the leagues and even, even the, the, the language. But, I'm saying back then, it's really a, a time when players would come in and everything was new. So the way we were doing things was really new. There wasn't as much uh, communication between the different uh, countries and, and really about the uh, style of coaching and, and things of that nature. So these two men, and I remember just the sh- uh, great skills and, and uh, the talent level was was really high on both of them. Um, I remember it was probably easier for Zubov to get uh, comfortable with our group, like because of his uh, his good nature. Uh, Kovalev, uh, Alexi took a little bit longer, but uh, he, and he did his own thing. Like he just wanted to play and wanted the puck, and he would stay on the ice for two, three minutes. Coaches would get upset at him. <laughs> he didn't care much. I, I think uh, that was a challenge with him, but. Uh, uh, you continue that in NHL too. Yeah, uh, I, I, I know, I know, and I remember the story. You know, yeah, yeah that, that was a, an a habit that a lot of coaches try to break. But 
but they were both unbelievable players for us. So it, it was nice to see them uh, start their career. And, and we took a part in that, like all the leaders and the, the older players with the Rangers in Binghamton. I took these guys under their wings a little bit. And, you know, with, I remember guys taking Kovalev fishing. Uh, Kovalev or Zubov really liked to fish. Came out and then another guy would, you know, take him out to lunch and to dinner and make sure that these guys were, uh, you know, at a, at a family atmosphere uh, when they came over. So talking about Mike Keen a little bit, um, how many, so when you came in, you actually started the year off with the Rangers in 93. You actually broke the opening night roster. Yeah. What was that training camp like going into that year? Uh, obviously, you know, it's the, the whole myth or the story that Keenan showed the Mets parade, you know, they won a training camp and said this is the goal of the season. But how was that camp different than the previous camps you were in or just any coaching you saw before? Yeah, the, the focus, I, I, you know, that was my seventh NHL camp at that time. And I had never, uh, never got a, an exhibition game in a, in a, out of training camp. So six straight years going to camp and being cut and sent, sent back either the junior team or uh, five times to my, uh, to my American league team. And, and then um, I ended up getting, you know, getting a shot playing exhibition games and playing a bunch of them. And that's when we used to play between nine and 11 games. So you need a lot of bodies. And uh, I thought I had a real good camp. I had a real good summer of training and, and, uh, I just remember that group being so focused. I remember, you know, from the start of the journey, and, and that's what Keenan called it, like we're getting on a journey. And uh, it was super, super focused with Mess and Kevin Lowe leading the way. And, and uh, it's it's no surprise that uh, they ended up winning the, the Cup that year. So you played a couple of years, obviously, with the Rangers, and you played with Mark Messier. What are, you know, you hear about his leadership skills. You know, how do you, how do the people in the locker room, like, look to him. Does he a loud guy in the locker room? Is he kind of a lead by example kind of a guy or is it all the above? Yeah, no, he, he, he would pick his spots. Like, uh, you know, mess was pretty, uh, you know, and I don't have the most experience I played. I played with him a little, you know, a little bit, but my, my, my recollection and, and what I remember is just, just the moment. Like he, he was all about the timing and all about moment. And, and, uh, mess would play a certain way before Christmas when we played, uh, you know, if we played Hartford or if we played uh, Calgary or, or, you know, something that might be not a game that you, you really get up for. Uh, he, but then when he needed to get up for things, he did. And and that's what I remember of him. Like, he would pick his spots. Uh, and we had enough leadership in, the, in that room for him not to be their guy every night. And, uh, and I just remember I, I thought the combination of, of him uh, – you know, saying things in the room, but also uh, following it up with actions on the ice. And that's been well documented, but he had the ability, the ability to, to do that and the ability to, to really pick his spots uh, and, and, and be patient and analyze situation. And, and, you know, Mess was, was that good a leader because he had a really good leadership uh, group around him uh, that started with, I, I think that, you know, first and foremost, I, I, it was uh, Kevin Lowe behind. Like he, Mess would say something, but Kevin, Kevin really was always in his ear and and and, and would all, always reinforce uh, within the room. And you came back up for a few more games later on in the year. And actually, before or I guess after you played uh, in those games, the Rangers kind of had a new look going into the postseason too. Were you surprised by the amount of moves they made, especially getting rid of a player like Mike Gardner, who was, I mean, at the time was the top player in the NHL. And uh, was, I think he was just the all-star MVP the year before. Um, so, I mean, that was a pretty big move and a bold move that Neil Smith made before. the. Well, I, I remember, like, I, I went down to the minors and in Binghamton. I, I broke my uh, collarbone. So I was out for eight weeks and my sternum, I actually broke my sternum and, and collarbone. So it was a major injury and I was out for a long period of time. So um, I remember following the team and, and, and watching a lot of games and, um, I knew there were talks about them, you know, uh, making some moves and, and, uh, they, they went out. I, I remember getting called up and, and, uh, at trade deadline, the team was in Calgary and, and, you know, we had a rookie meal that night and, and a lot of guys, the, the atmosphere was really tense. And, and I remember, I, I believe Tony Monty or somebody didn't show up for the, the meal and, and, you know, there were talks already that some of the guys would get, might get, uh, traded. So. 
it's not surprising. Like I, I think when you go for it, you, you seize your opportunity. And I thought, you know, probably uh, Keenan and, and uh, Neil Smith thought that was obviously their, their one big opportunity and they went for it. And then following the season, um, you get dealt to Boston. So what was that kind of emotion like? Because really, that was the first time in a few years you were switching up to a new organization, or first time ever you were switching to a new organization. Yeah. So what was that kind of like? Uh, that it was good. Like, for me, it was good because I, I remember Coley Cam gave me a call. Coley, you know, Keenan left. Coley came in, and uh, he had coached us in Binghamton, that really good team that we had that year, uh, a couple of years prior. And he was uh, – he was assistant in New York and they he ended up coming down and Ron Smith went up with the Rangers to finish the season. And uh, so I had a good relationship with, uh, with Colin Campbell. And, and I remember him calling me just saying, you know what, then like I look at our lineup, I think you're an NHL player and I don't see you uh, playing regular with us. So I think uh, we're giving you an opportunity to go to a team that's looking and would like to have you. So uh Kind of do doing me a favor and, and getting a defenseman in return and then Featherstone. So um, it worked out for both parties and and but that was a lockout year. So I ended up showing up in in uh, in Boston and had a real real good camp. And then when I'm ready to go and play my first full NHL season after making a team, uh, we didn't play any hockey. So I asked to go down to the American League because I had a young family and and uh, they they uh, they sent me down and. And sure enough, uh, you know, we played about 20 games. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm back with the Rangers. So it was, a, it was a, a long season with a lot of twists and turns. So you played one more year with the Rangers. And then you moved on to uh, our rival, the Philadelphia Flyers. And I actually still remember, uh, I think it was like a Sunday or Saturday game on Fox. And you beat up Jeff Bukaboom on the blue line. And I was like, Oh man, this is not good. <laughs> Everything was in the first five minutes. They gave me a real, so it was a real tone setter. And I was like, man, I mean, this is not good. Yeah. I remember, I, I remember, uh, book taking a two minute penalty and then gave me a shot a little bit. I'm like, uh, you, book, you want to go? Like I'm at home. Let, uh, let him get away with it. And, uh, if I can take book, a boom, I think in the trade off, I think our, my coach is pretty happy. So with the flyers, you played on the, uh, you know, the famous, uh, Legion of Doom teams with uh, Lindros and Leclerc. So, what was it like playing with those guys in the locker room? And uh, and, and Lindros as a leader, um, what was it like playing with him? Well, it was quite a change from from the veteran team that we had in, in, with the Rangers and, and the confidence that the Ranger uh, dressing room had. And, and you know, uh, you, you go to uh, another really good NHL team, but with a different type of of uh, of group and, and leadership and great in their own right. Like it was, it was a, a really fun to see uh, Lindros and Leclerc and Renberg like really run, run the at night in night out. They're the best line out there and uh, quite something to see and, and, and to be part of it. And I was lucky enough that first year we had a good run. We unfortunately lost to Detroit in the finals, but um, it was a, it was a, our, our division was real tight, and uh, uh, I remember Lindros really looking up to Mess. I remember him, uh, you know, like asking Dan anything. You know, he would go out for dinner, and he'd ask a lot of questions on how Mess did things. Obviously, they they were, I don't know if they were close, but I know they were friends, and they had played uh, on some uh, kind of team together. And um, but it was just a. a, a, a leadership and progress when I got to uh, Philly as opposed to New York, which, which was really established. So you were saying you, you guys lost the final to Detroit yeah. that year. Now you did beat the Rangers in the conference yeah. finals. Uh, that was uh, the Gretzky first year. So what was, uh, I guess you guys really dominated the Rangers that series too, won four to one. What was something you guys did that really shut the Rangers down that, um, you know, cause they were rolling pretty good going to the postseason. Yeah. I can't remember. Is that in this uh, second round? They had just beat Jersey, I believe. Right. That was the, the conference finals. Yeah, yeah that was. Uh, you, you know what? We were rolling. Like, we were. Um, I, I don't remember much about the Rangers. I remember that they had played really well and they had surprised because I thought the best team that could give us a run for our money on our side in the Eastern uh, Conference was uh, New Jersey. And because every time we played them was, was a much harder game to play. 
than any uh, other opponents uh, on in the East. And uh, I think the Rangers took care of them, if I remember correctly. And um, it, yeah. I, I remember our, our series against against the uh, the Rangers for some reason. I think we got a tired team. I don't know if they were uh, beat up a little bit from from their previous uh, rounds, but uh, we were just rolling. Like we we went through. I believe either Buffalo and, and New York or Pittsburgh and New York that year. And, and we weren't, uh, we were still in pretty good shape. Like we had not faced a great, great adversity. Like we, we were all held. So go into the finals. Um, the Legion of Doom Lang was like, you were saying that you guys were rolling and then all of a sudden you hit Detroit and they got completely shut down by, uh, by the Detroit defense. Was there anything in the locker room talk like, you know, like what can we do to kind of get around, you know, to figure this out yeah. or, you know, what strategy was Detroit used really just baffled you guys? Well, it, if I go back, it's, um, you know, Detroit was the best team we had, we had faced and it was, their style was totally different and their style would be different from one line to the next. And, and, you know, they put the five Russians on the ice and, and really control the puck with puck possession. And then they, they would hit you with, uh, you know, their third, fourth line would, would just grind the, grind you really, really hard. <laughs> and and, and uh, they, were, they were defending uh, as well as any team uh, that we had played up to that point. So obviously they didn't win by accident. I, I thought our first couple games were probably the best games that could have gone either way. And uh, once that was done, we were, uh, I, I, we never recovered. We were rattled and uh, didn't get our bearings back. Like I think, I think that's where the lack of experience and, and uh, a playoff deep playoff experience within our, our core group might have, uh, you know, played against us. But um, ultimately I think Detroit was a better team and, and uh, won the cup. I don't think it should have been a four, uh, you know, four, four straight type uh, series, but uh, we were facing, we got, got stunned early in our building. Uh, we had home ice advantage and we got stunned losing the first two at home after tight battles. And next thing you know, we're behind the eight ball and, and never recovered. And you guys had the, your head coach, Terry Murray at the time had the famous choking, you know, choking line during his press conference in game three. Was that something that the locker room really, you know, lashed out about against him or is that kind of an overblown? Yeah, thing? it was, I think it's it's tough to say it's a little bit of both, but I will say because everybody would would perceive it differently, and, and within a room of you know twenty twenty five guys, you uh, like to me it wasn't a big thing because I, I we were in a in a choking. It's probably not something a coach would would say now, and that's something I think he's he acknowledged afterwards. But uh, our our situation was precarious and, and uh, you, you need to always believe it and belief starts from uh, top down. And uh, he was stating a fact, you know, I, I think I read something afterwards where he, he, uh, Terry uh, might've said something, oh, if I do it over again, I wouldn't, you know, probably wouldn't use those words, but we were in a tough spot and, and, and that took, uh, we, still battled hard and, and came in and, and thought, you know, if we can only win one, but Detroit was that good. And then from there, you bounced around a couple more teams after Philly, and then you actually ended up with the Chicago Wolves, and you won the uh, IHL championship with them. Um, and then you went over to England to play. Yeah. Uh, once I was done. So what was that like? Well, it, you know what? It, I wanted to go to Europe. Uh, I didn't care where. And I remember telling my agent, just if you find me something uh, in Europe, I, I had an American League offers, but I thought for me and my family at that time, the best way and, and just get do something new. I, I didn't want to be an up and down guy with, with an American League team. Uh, and, you know, and because the bus and, and <laughs> was really taking its toll. But physically, uh, the American League is a really tough league with the travel and the three and three. So I felt if I could go over and, and really, you know, have fun playing and, and share and maybe start coaching in a way. And, and then also have the opportunities to, to spend quality time with my less games, less travel, you spend more time with the family. And, and my, my agent came up and, and said, Dan, there's actually a team that's looking for, for a player assistant coach. If you could go and 
play uh, Newcastle. I, I said, you know, I just asked him, where's Newcastle? And next thing you know, I, I was on a, uh, on a plane and, and met with them. And uh, that's where, that's how I ended up. And talk about the AHL and travel. So what is the worst travel story you have from the AHL? Oh, I've got a, got a, quite a bit of them, but I, you know, I, I, I remember playing that lockout year. I was in, in uh, Providence with, Bruins our team and, and we played three and three and uh Steve Casper was our coach and, and we we end up playing either Binghamton, we go to Binghamton, uh, Hershey, and back through Binghamton to play Syracuse on, at one o'clock on a Sunday. So it's three and three and we're dead tired and uh, we come in Syracuse and none of the rooms are ready. So it's, it's something like two, three AM and, and that's in a snowstorm. So the, it took us longer to get there. And, um, we end up, we end up coming in and waiting for a room and everybody's upset. And, uh, we just show up at the rink and, and I remember him saying, I don't want to see a one tape to tape past it. If you guys make 20 icings in the first five minutes, I don't care. <laughs> And we're, we we kind of, we kind of laugh, at it, but, you know, guys that no energy and and you're just trying to you know go through and, and really you know win a game on the road on a three and three and and we we ended up slowly just icing the puck, icing the puck, icing the puck. And next thing you know, they're not getting any tractions and and we I, I believe we ended up winning the game two to one. But uh, and from there we start with no really low expectations to that game and ended up having a really fun game to play. And, but that's, that's what travel was about. Like, it's, you know, we, we, we'd go into maritime provinces. You never knew if you could make it back with, with the flights and uh, depending on uh, snow conditions or wind conditions, if you go to uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, uh, uh, it'd be a crapshoot. So yeah, those were fun days. You know, you, 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 you get to spend a lot of time with your teammates. You, you travel together. You get to be a, a tight group, and uh, but it's also physically demanding. So then you, from England, you took that, uh, the coach, player coach experience, and you came back to the Quebec League, and you actually have now gone full circle with your coaching career. You started off with uh, Moncton back in 2002, and now you're back there as the head coach now. So what are, um, when you start off the Quebec League, what are some of the things that you took from your playing career that you put into your coaching? Well, I you know, I was, I, I was starting when I started my coaching, I was, I was between like, uh, you know, the, the coaching conference, coaching clinics were, were, uh, were not starting the, that had been around for, for a bit, but, uh, there are certainly, uh, more emphasis on, on skills development, starting skills development, uh, doing a lot of video, uh, analyzing games and, uh, you know, back then in the juniors, you'd have one assistant. So I was the only assistant with a, with a volunteer assistant that would jump on for home games. But we did everything. And I was lucky enough to have a good head coach that started me right. I thought it was, you know, the right way to start. I, I was overworked and, and I was overanalyzing uh, things. But I, I think it really served me well for the rest of my career. And you made a jump into the NHL uh, as an assistant coach of the Islanders. And while you were the Islanders, a weird thing happened. Al Arbor came back for one game to coach his 15th other game. What was that like for the staff to have him come back in the locker room? Uh, was that, and I know it was more of a publicity stunt for the Islanders wise, but was it cool for the staff or was it one of those things like, why are we doing this? Uh, you know, we have actually have games to win here. No, it, it was a really cool experience. Like, I, I remember that experience. Uh, and, you know, uh, and Nolan told me that that's something he, he, he had thought about. So I don't know if. If, if it's the team or if, he, but, but Ted was a lot about, uh, you know, he loves some special coaches that, that have been in the league. And he was a big fan of Fred Giro and a uh, big fan of, of Mr. Arbor. And uh, that old day was pretty magical when he, when he came and he didn't want to do a big speech. And I remember him standing beside me on the bench and just said, ah, you make your changes. I don't, I don't want to be in the way. I remember him saying that, but, uh, you know, Ted wanted him to be part of it and, and Adam, uh, share his, his experience, but he, he came back and talked to the team before the game and, and the whole game, we played a real good game. And, um, you know, luckily we, we won that game. I remember big picture grabbing everybody on the ice and, 
with Mr. Arbor taking a, a team picture. And I thought that was such a classy move and, and to a, you know, uh, such a big part of the uh, Islanders organization. And then you went down to Tampa and you guys had really good success your first year. And then um, yeah, they made a coaching change to Cooper after uh, I think it was your last year there. Um, and then you went up to the Rangers and you made a really nice cup run. Um, so what was that like coming back to New York uh, and, and taking over behind the bench? That that was a great, uh, great experience. Like, like I, you know, you got to remember, like, I know we went through my, my career, but you know, drafted a Ranger, uh, always a Ranger in a way. Like to me, I was that that was my team. I was drafted by them. And it was it was a real uh, full circle coming back to to, uh, to the to the Rangers with a really good, uh, fun staff to work with. So, um, it was, it was a dream come true that, that, that now my kids are gone. Uh, they're at, at the university and, uh, we're, uh, living in Manhattan that I'd never done before. And, and with a team and, you know, in transition with a new coaching staff and, and a lot of new things for us to, to see and, and, and live and uh no it was it was a real good experience real good year uh and our team got better and better if you remember we have started i, I think one win in the first 10 games most of our games on the road because of uh, the reno to the, to the garden and yeah they were doing the garden i think martin wrong gave about 10 goals up in anaheim exa- one night. exactly uh was it Anaheim or uh, San Jose? Like I, I know we we had we had some tough tough games out west. We had training camp out west, so we were we put ourselves in a tough spot. But at Christmas, we knew we had to win something like seven out of uh, ten. You know, if you count those segments, almost four games out of every five games moving forward. If uh, if we needed a chance, if we wanted a chance to make the playoffs let alone uh, win a cup. So our focus after Christmas uh, was sharp. And I remember it, it all uh, started with a meeting we had in uh, in, in Florida. Uh, we're playing the Panthers the next day. And and uh, that's when, the, the, you know, the, the meeting set the tone for the rest of our season and really uh, changed, uh, changed that season for the better. So, so- Similar to the 94 season when they made the cup run, you guys made a really big trade at the end of the year, uh, acquiring Martin St. Louis for uh, Ryan Callahan, who was your captain. So what was that move in the locker room? Like, was it a surprise to everyone on the team that that move happened? Or was it kind of like, hey, we need the offensive punch? Um, you know, just, you know, Callahan was the name that got, you know. Got yeah, it, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't It was a surprise in a way because I think, I don't I think Callahan was in a contract year and, and you know, he was having his own uh, difficulty a little bit with the team, and I don't know if that stems from his from the contract or anything else. But uh, I think I think the opportunity to get a, a player of uh, Marty St. Louis uh, stature on on our team was the right fit. And not only did it give us a skill uh, boost with skills, but really uh, uh, you know leadership and confidence with our group uh, really helped solidify our, our, our group and, and kind of a little bit of a glue and inside our dressing room and, and a little bit of a uh, an emotional uh, leader in a way too because if we remember that the that playoff runs you know us trailing to Pittsburgh and and, and Marty uh, uh, losing his mom and and continuing to and, and being really gave us a, an emotional boost on top of, of the boost of his uh, excellent play on the ice. So so for us, we're riding a Marty's wave uh, for, for a little bit there. I was going to say, you guys are down 3-1 to Pittsburgh, and then unfortunately he loses his mother, and then you guys storm back, win three in a row um, to close that series out. And then you continue on to Montreal. Uh, you know, game one of Montreal, you guys knock Carey Price out. <laughs> uh, you know, so that was – yeah, some Ranger luck there. Yep. Um, yeah. You move through there, and then you get, you get to the final. I, I would say Ranger luck, but uh, I, I went back and looked at the stats of the following games. Like, we outplayed Montreal every game. We were out shooting him, uh, you know, 30 to 20 shots. Uh, their backup that came in, they actually put their third-string goalie in, uh, Tokarski, and he was he – was, yeah, and I'm not sure if he wasn't first or second star 
couple of those games. Like he, he played really well. We ended up winning those games, and uh, we'll never know with with, my, uh, uh, with Carey Price being out because he he was sure like their best player. So, uh, but we were playing well. We we're also playing really well. And then when you guys get to the finals, you know, just a heart wrenching finals, three overtime losses, two in uh, two in yeah. double OT. Um, you know, game, games one and two, you guys are out in LA. You lose both in overtime. You have the lead in each game. You know what? What kind of with the flight home? What was the flight back to New York? Was it a somber mode? Was it more of like a hey guys, we've outplayed them for most of the you know almost fifty eight of the sixty minutes of yeah. the game. You know we were in this thing. Yeah, we 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 believe we're a group that and, and we had gone through enough adversity in that season, and we had enough uh, leadership in that group, and we're a very mild tempered group. Like there's not a lot of them in our team. Like we weren't a like we didn't run uh, teams out of the building. We didn't over out hit team. We we're just a nice group of guys <laughs> playing hockey together, and and uh, so nobody hated the Rangers like the players anyway because we didn't have that. Like we, I think we might have had Ursula. He was he wasn't playing. He was he was scrapped. But other than that, our players that were playing the game every night were just you know the referees liked us, and so we were just going about our business. We we were determined. We thought we'd come back and win. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the bounces didn't go our way. Like, I remember the, the next season, uh, you know, I, I went to Montreal, but I, I remember the uh, first meeting with the referees in the league. Uh, they put a video, and, and one of the goals that, that they say would be refused this year was one of the goals that was scored against us in the finals, where, where uh, Lundqvist was interfered with uh, by, by mm. uh, either Toffoli or for one of the big guys and and that goal would not count this year but it did count that year and 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 you know who knows what it cost us i mean cost us a game anyway so now that postseason lundquist was i mean he was huge he was so unbelievable in that um is that one of the better postseason performances you've seen out of an individual player ah uh, that's tough to say because i've you know i I've watched a lot of hockey, and, and if I go back to Ron Nixall when he won it in uh, against Edmonton, he, he won the Conn Smythe in a losing cause. I, I remember him. I remember following that, following that as a kid. Uh, I remember seeing Ken Dryden in Montreal uh, dominating in the playoffs. That, that that gives you my age a little bit, but um, uh, he certainly was was our uh, you know a rock every night, and and uh, he. he he actually uh, carried the load when we didn't play so well, and uh, he was there when we when when we needed the the right saves at the right moment. So we had a real good season in the playoffs. I know in those game sevens, you know, both of them were two one wins, and uh, you know he's yeah. his head in those games. And as a fan, you sit there with your, uh, you know, you, you can't believe what's going on. I'm sure on the bench, it's like, oh my goodness. Yeah, we're, well. You know, it's it such uh, managing momentums in the playoffs is such a key uh, part of it, and uh, and and some of these, like sometimes we remember, we forget how far we with some of these, these key moments, whether it's a, a key save or or a key uh, a key goal, you know, just to break uh, your opponent's momentum or, or or to you know just continue with your own momentum. So. Uh, Henrik was was uh, was certainly a part of that. And then you alluded to before you went to Montreal after the year. Um, while you were there, they had the you know, you, you went there for Terry with Terrian, who actually was Vigneault's best friend, which is pretty funny to move on to a, a, a different coach there. Yep. Um, but while you were there, Terrian, you guys had a good run the first year, and it just seemed like he could never get them over the hump. And they eventually moved on to Claude Julian. Um, it seemed like as soon as Julian left Boston, that was a guaranteed slam dunk higher for the Canadians. Was that something that the whole organization inside was like, okay, Tarion, you know, he might be on the way out here or, you know, when, once Julian became available, was that kind of a thought? Cause I know the Montreal media really played that up. Yeah. But not for us. Like it, when you're coaching and, and you're part of a coaching staff and, and uh, Mike Terry, our team was, was not doing badly, you know, like our team had done pretty well. If, if you look at Mike's numbers, they were, they were pretty good. Um, so it was surprising, you know, like I, I remember that, that happened in the, in, a, in the all-star break or Olympic break or I'm trying to remember. I know it was a break because it was February 13 or 14 when they announced it. And, and I was just surprised 
and uh, you know you got to. It, it, it's always tough when you're on a coaching staff and, and they make a change like this. But you know the, the, the coach coming in was a uh, somebody I didn't know personally, got to know and got to work with, and and for me professionally, it's a great experience to have to to add to my uh, you know to the coaches that I've I've had the uh, the chance to work with and. And Claude was certainly one of the best coaches in the league. And then after that year, you became the head coach of the Lithuanian yeah. national team. <laughs> well, How did that come about? this comes from uh, from me being. I, I still had one year, uh, you know, with with Montreal. I was let go. Uh, two of us uh, were let go at the end of uh, of my fourth season there, and uh, you know they they made a few changes and and sitting at home going, okay, what. What's gonna? What's Daniel Lacroix? What am I? And I want to kind of resource and, and go back, not going back to school, but really uh, uh, look at different ways of that I could uh, get some growth in my in my uh, in my game in my coaching game. So um, one of the ways was for presenting a lot of uh, at clinics, and I ended up presenting in with for the NHL in China and Finland and and. Uh, where else did I go? Uh, they had me going to a, a few places to do uh, hockey presentations, and and at the same time, I had uh, an ex teammate of mine, uh, Dave Zubris, who's Lithuanian, and just been, been voted uh, um, elected as uh, president of the Lithuanian uh, Hockey Federation. And he gave me a call. He goes, "Dan, if you got nothing, I, I'd love for you to come in and, and try." you know, grow our program because I think they had four or five uh, ice hockey arena and I knew nothing about uh, Lithuania and besides, you know, knowing Zuby and knowing him. Uh, so I ended up, I ended up saying, yes, why not? And it was a really, really good experience. And then you stayed in Europe and you actually coached in the German league and you had to go over for Leon Dreisaitl's father uh, in the Dell league. What was that uh, experience also, you know, international coaching compared to a U.S., you know, you were U.S., you know, base for forever, and then you went over and Yeah, it, it was a great experience. Like, on, on the, uh, like, for me to, to be exposed to, I that, that year I traveled quite a bit. I did a couple tournaments with uh, Lithuania, Team Lithuania, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, I was traveling to visiting a friend of mine in Berlin who was coaching the, the Berlin Bears, and uh, and then I got a call that day when I was there, and I happened to be in Germany, and, and it was it was uh, you know it was a team, it was Cologne that was calling and just just inquiring about if if I'd ever be interested, and I said yeah, perhaps I'd be interested. He goes, oh, well, let me call you back. You know, I, I'll, we're not sure what we're gonna do. We we feel we got a team that's underperforming. And next thing I know, I came back to the states, and I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Tampa for Christmas, and I get a call right at Christmas time, and and uh, and and you know they asked me if I wanted to become the coach. And my wife knew, my wife was all happy that finally I'd be in Tampa for the rest of the winter, and we could spend some time together. And that that lasted about three days, <laughs> and I was back on the plane uh, going to Germany, and the hockey there, I was surprised how how good and, and professional. Fifteen thousand. Uh, fans at our games uh, in Cologne. It's a beautiful arena, a uh, great city. So on the personal side, it was it was a, a really good spot for me to be and work with good people. And, uh, you know, it, it was kind of also first chance for me, those two teams, Lithuanian teams and the, uh, and, uh, the Cologne uh, team. It was my first opportunity to really uh, coach my own team for an extended period of time. And, and that was a lot of fun to build something and, and to put all these little experiences that I've had with really good coaches and, and I have the, the opportunity to do it away from, away from North America and just learn and grow as, as a coach. So, so that was really uh, like, for me, it was, it, it was a great, great year. And now you're back to being the head coach in, uh, in Moncton. So what is that uh, this year? Obviously is weird with the COVID-19 and everything. So what are some things that, you know, you guys are hearing for the league, uh, you know, continuing to play or, um, you know, what are some of the parameters you guys are working under? Uh, it, it's a challenge. Like it's a challenge, but, uh, like we, we, uh, we stopped like all the leagues last year. Like we, we had the best team in Canada. Like we, I think we, 
I took over in Moncton last year at the same time at Christmas time, and, and they had. Uh, I think we, I believe we, we lost two only two games and to finish the season. We had the best team in, in the country, made a lot of moves. So with those moves uh, came giving away a lot of our young, uh, talented players. And uh, it's, it's a rebuilding year. We got 14, 15 rookies on our team. And with COVID, there's no guarantee. So uh, one thing we did realize uh, quickly is that we're the only t uh, league going uh, on this side of the pond. Like, you know, and all the major junior leagues weren't, weren't playing. So for us, we felt privileged. And we've had to uh, to be able to adapt to different things. We've been we've had a lot of games canceled, thirteen games. Uh, so so for us, it, it's like okay, let's not get uh, we, we're getting prepared for this week. And and when if things change, you need to to be able to adapt. And part that's what we've done as a coaching staff and as a an organization. Hope everything is, is going to work out better after for the second half but i know right now the league decided to give us a, a give the players and everybody else a, a month break and we're back at work uh, i think early january where we're uh, you know after we do our, our confinement because we got to go back and confine for a couple of weeks but after that i think it, it'll be good to go well good luck the rest of the year and uh, enjoy your break down there in tampa and uh and thank you for joining oh, us thank today. you very much thanks for having me Thank you again to Daniel Lacroix for joining us this week. It was a lot of fun sitting down and talking about his career and learning some new stories about his time with the Rangers. And we wish him and his team, the Moncton Wildcats, all the best this season. And that does it for Episode 2 of the Broadway Hat Podcast. Please hit the follow button on Spotify and follow the Broadway Hat Podcast Instagram account to be notified when new episodes come out. Thanks for listening.